Let us read together in the Word of God. We are studying the book of Acts in our morning worship, and we are in the middle of the second missionary journey, and in Acts chapter 17 at verse 16. Acts chapter 17, verse 16, Paul reaches Athens. Now while Paul was waiting for them, Silas and Timothy, at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. And so he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. Some also of the Epicurean and the Stoic philosophers met him, and uh, some said, um, what would this uh, babbler say? (laughs) Actually, the Greek is nastier than that. The word babbler in Greek there is a gutter sparrow, uh, meaning a little sparrow that hops up and down the gutters, picking up any piece of uh, chaff or corn or seed that happens to be blowing about in the wind. What would this uh, gutter sparrow say? And others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. Now the point is of course that in Greek Paul would have preached Jesus Kai Anastas, Jesus and the resurrection. But they thought that Anastas was the name of another God, not resurrection. And so they thought, well, here are two new gods that we can add to the gods we already have. Jesus and Anastas. He seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he preached Jesus and Anastas. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, Mars Hill, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you present for? You bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the middle of the Areopagus, Mars Hill, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And he made from one every nation of men to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their habitation. That they should seek God in the hope that they might feel after him and find him. And yet he is not far from each one of us. For, and he's now quoting the Greek poets rather than the Old Testament which these men would not recognize. And so, since they understand the Greek poets, he quotes now from a man called Epimenides. For in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your poets have said, and 
he's quoting more Greek poets now, Aratus and <coughs> Cleanthes. Um, For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, a representation by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, hmm. We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from among them. But some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Amen, and may the Lord add his blessing to his word and give us an understanding of it. It was almost inevitable that Paul should want to go to Athens. He himself was a university man from uh, Tarsus, which was a university city, and he had sat in Tarsus (coughs) at the feet of the great teacher Gamaliel, And so in his Jewish heart, he longed to go to the famous uh, academic and intellectual center that was Athens, in much the same way in which we in this country might want to go to see the colleges in Oxford or in Cambridge, or in much the same way in which an American would want to go and see Harvard or Cornell universities. Athens was a magnet in the ancient world. Today we say all roads lead to Rome, but in that world all roads led to Athens. And all that was brilliant and clever and glorious uh, was here in Athens. And it is Uh, an indisputable fact that uh, much of our own life and culture today have been determined by the glory that was Greece. Uh, For example, the word politics is a Greek word, as indeed are the words election and democratic. When you use these words, you are speaking Greek because Greece was the home of what we understand by modern democracy. Democracy originated in the Greek city-states when men voted for candidates. Not only so, Greece was the home of modern sculpture and architecture, the Parthenon, the Elgin marbles, the temple at Delphi and so on, uh, which are now so precious that if you go to Greece and are caught taking away so much as a stone from any of these sites, you will be arrested. And it's interesting to see just what a powerful influence classical architecture has been throughout the years. Greek architecture has often been taken as the norm in architecture and at this very moment you are sitting in a building which owes its origins to classical Greece because in the guidebooks this church is described as a pseudo-classical building and the half-imitation pillars that you see at the front, the tympanum 
and the apron front of the church. All of these would have been recognized by the Greeks. Not only so, Greece was the home of uh, philosophy, and Plato and Aristotle are still the standard works in the universities today. I recall plodding wearily away at King's College through Aristotle's Ethics and uh, Plato's Republic and Plato's Phaedo. And, of course, Greece was the home of modern drama, the plays of uh, Euripides and Aeschylus and uh, Sophocles, Oedipus Rex, Antigone, and so on, are still great classics on the stage. And yet, at the heart of all of that, the politics, the democracy, the art, the sculpture, the architecture, the philosophy, and the drama, at the heart of all that, Paul discovered an altar to the unknown God. And round that altar to the unknown God, there lay the ruins of a once great civilization that had now produced mere dilettantes and near conversationalists. The Athenians who lived there spent their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. One speaks of the Athenian spirit. And a man who has an Athenian spirit is not someone who is seriously interested in finding out the truth. He's the sort of man who can talk about anything. He'll talk about religion or about politics or art or the problems of society. He'll talk about Jesus. But he has no serious interest in coming to a knowledge of the truth. The Athenian spirit, the spirit of people who were mere dilettantes and triflers with the truth. And these men, these talkers, these blasé conversationalists, these world-weary cynics, gathered round an altar to an unknown God were the end product of Greek civilization. Nowadays, of course, when we go to Athens, we go as tourists. But Paul had not gone there as a tourist. Paul had gone to Athens as an ambassador of Jesus Christ. And two things immediately captured his attention in the city. First of all, the idols. While Paul was waiting, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. In fact, the Greek word there, uh, provoked within him, is the Greek um, paroxuneto, parox, from which we get the English word paroxysm. We would say nowadays he nearly had a heart attack when he saw the idolatry of the city. He nearly had a seizure when he saw the idolatry. Now, of course, to us as tourists, these uh, statues and temples uh, are objects of beauty. This is why men go to Athens. We look on them as works of art with artistic merit. But to Paul, they were an insult to the true and the living God. These idols were rivals to the true and the living God. And these were objects of worship. Men, in their madness and their folly and their blindness, were saying their prayers to these statues. You shall not make for yourself any graven image of anything that is on the earth or in the heaven above, 
you shall not bow down and worship them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God. And that was what the law of God said. And so Paul looked at Athens. And he was uh, shocked to the core. And I wonder what Paul would make of our idolatrous civilization. With gods, the god of science, the god of progress. gods of war gods of money gods of possession gods of lust gods of power do you think Paul would not be inclined to have another heart attack his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. The second thing that Paul noticed in Athens was this altar to the unknown God. In verse 23 he said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you're very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. And uh, that God had been built by gamblers, by (coughs) speculators who weren't just sure if there was a God or not. Well, maybe Zeus did exist. Well, maybe he didn't exist. Maybe Ares existed and listened to your prayers and, well, maybe he didn't exist. Maybe Hermes and Poseidon and Pallas Athene, maybe they existed. Maybe they didn't. So, just to be on the safe side and just to be sure they built an altar to the unknown God and maybe he would hear them and answer their prayers. Oh, oh, oh my friends, what a confession of bankruptcy that whole world of civilization and learning and culture confessing its ignorance of the living God 400 years of art and architecture and sport and drama and games, philosophy all summed up in an altar to an unknown God, a society worshipping idols round an altar to an unknown God. And that was what Paul found at Athens. And I believe that that is a parable of the human condition and of the world today a society worshipping idols round an altar to an unknown God not only so I believe that that is a parable of man today worshipping false gods giving himself to other gods selling himself to other gods money and progress and materialism and in his heart there is an altar to an unknown God 
This is the teaching of Scripture, that this is the tragedy of man, of sinner man, of lost man, of man without Christ. That at his heart there is an altar to an unknown God. And using this altar as a starting point, Paul preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. I wonder if there's anyone here uh, whose problem is that this morning. False gods. Is your life cluttered up, choked with false gods and substitute gods? And that your heart there is an altar to the unknown God. That confrontation in Athens between the true and the living God and the idols of men, between the known God, Jesus and the resurrection, and the unknown God, worshipped at that altar is a confrontation which teaches us there are two roads by which you cannot get to God. The first is the road of religion. There was no lack of religion in Greece. In fact, it, Paul complained to the men of Athens that part of their problem was they were too religious. Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Everywhere there were gods. I wonder if you've ever caught yourself using the word pagan in a careless way today. I uh, often rebuke myself for using the word carelessly. We use the word and we know what it means, but we use it carelessly. You look at a situation and you say, oh, that's just a pagan situation. Or you look at people's morals and you say, oh, that's just pagan morality or you look at a worldly family a religious godless non-Christian and you say well that lot they're just absolutely pagan that is to malign the pagans because the pagans were very religious indeed and that's more than can be said of many modern folk. Not, are, not only are many modern folk not Christian, they're not really pagan. They're nothing. The Greeks were pagans. And they had gods of everything and gods everywhere. There were gods on the rooftop, gods in the garden, there were gods of fertility, gods of beauty. There was a god of the chase. There was a god for marriage. There were gods in the pantry. There were gods on the fireside. There was a god of the sea. There were gods of war. There were gods in the trees. There were gods in the rivers. There were gods in the flowers. There were gods everywhere. And all that religion did not bring them to God. Because all that religion had this characteristic that is so common to religion. It was man-centered. You see, the Greek gods were not real gods at all. They had no objective existence. Like the true God. They were simply the figments of men's imaginations. 
They were simply ordinary men and women who had been blown up to the size of gods. And they had all the weaknesses and the foibles and the failings of sinful men. That's why these gods couldn't save men. It was all man-centered. And man was still on the center of the stage. You see, religion has to do with men seeking for God. But the gospel of Jesus Christ has to do with God seeking for man. That's why the terms religious and uh, Christian are not interchangeable. A man can be devoutly religious without being a Christian. I've met uh, several folks since I came to Inverness who told me privately that they were very religious. They didn't seem to be very interested in public worship. Very little of their substance went to the Lord's work. They read the Bible occasionally and they said their prayers, in quotation marks, from time to time, and all of that made them very religious. But they weren't Christians. It's possible to be religious and lost. The Athenians were religious. But they were lost. I came across this fine quotation from Roy Gustafsson. Religion is man's quest for God. The gospel is the Savior God seeking lost man. Religion or originates on earth. The gospel originated in heaven. Religion is man-made. The gospel is the gift of God. Religion is the story of what a sinful man tries to do for a holy God. The gospel is the story of what a holy God has done for sinful men. Religion is good views. The gospel is good news. Religion does not always bring men to God. <clears throat> and secondly, wisdom does not always bring men to God. Here in Athens, Paul met two groups of the Greek philosophers, the Stoics and the Epicureans. These are very important men because their philosophies are still alive today. The Stoics believed in reason and good sense. These were the great things. A rational, sensible approach to life. Self-sufficiency. They were morally earnest. They were serious men. You didn't find decadence and drunkenness and immorality amongst the Stoics. Reason and sensibility. The Epicureans believed that pleasure was the chief end of life. And pleasure was the main thing. And the guiding principle was the avoidance of anything disagreeable. You avoided pain. You avoided passions. You avoided superstition. The fear of death. The fear of the grave. The fear of a judgment after you die. You avoid these things because they're disagreeable. Pleasure is the guiding principle in life. 
And of course, these philosophies are very much live issues today. Stoicism and Epicureanism are still philosophies by which men live today. People who believe in reason and uh, a sensible attitude to life and self-sufficiency, people who believe in the stiff upper lip are stoics. Folk who say to you, when you're down and out, come on now, pull yourself together, and be brave. But supposing you have no resources, how can you pull yourself together if you've no resources? How can you be brave if you've no courage? You know the story of David Hume, the Scottish philosopher? You can go and see his grave at the top end of Princess Street as you pass the North British Hotel and then the post office on the way to the Calton Hill. There's a big old cemetery in at the right hand side and you'll find David Hume's grave great Scottish philosopher a great atheist and he taught his mother to be an atheist and she came to die and they both knew she was dying and she said to David what am I going to do? I'm dying and he said come on the mother hold on and she said, how can I hold on when you have taken away from me everything that I used to hold on to? That's stoicism. The stiff upper lip. Be brave. And Epicureanism lives when men immerse themselves in pleasure and live lives dominated by the pleasure principle in which the chief end of man is to have fun and to be able to say at the end of the day that a good time was had by all. The chief end of man is to have fun and to say a good time was had by all. You see, wisdom does not automatically bring men to God. And at the heart of all that wisdom, there was an altar to the unknown God. After he left Athens, Paul went to Corinth and he later wrote uh, two letters to Corinth and in one of them, this is what he said, the world by wisdom knew not God. That was God's verdict on Greece. The world by wisdom knew not God. You see, the answer to life's problems and the answer to pain and to sin and to death is not the stiff upper lip of the Stoics and it's not the pleasure principle of the Epicureans. It is Jesus and the resurrection. I wonder if you've come to God's house today and your life is filled with wrong gods that cannot hear you and cannot help you and cannot save you. I wonder if you've come to God's house today with an altar to the unknown God at your heart. The men of Athens needed Jesus and the resurrection. 
not religion, not wisdom or philosophy, but Jesus and the resurrection. And inevitably, that kind of call demands a decision on your part. It's interesting to see the three ways in which the Athenians reacted to the gospel. Some of them mocked. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And that's one way of uh, responding to the gospel message, to dismiss the whole thing as um, rather ridiculous and uh, rather absurd. The Greeks thought it uh, laughable that a man should rise from the dead. And that is one way of uh, reacting to Jesus Christ. You simply dismiss him as absurd and irrelevant. Is there anyone here who in the secret of his heart or of her heart really believes that Jesus Christ is absurd and irrelevant? Some of them said, we will hear you again about this. In other words, some other time, not today, decision tomorrow, always decision tomorrow. I call these people the Jesus tomorrow people. Today, well, there are bills to pay and the kids to see grown up. There are meals to worry about and friendships to enjoy. There are holidays to plan and houses to buy. That's today. Tomorrow, Jesus. Or even, well, religion today, Jesus tomorrow. We will hear you again about this. You know, they never did. It's an extraordinary thing. Paul never went back to Athens. Some places he went to twice and thrice in his life. But he never went back to Athens. Maybe someone else did, I don't know. That was their chance. And they missed it. We will hear you again about this. Jesus tomorrow. And the third group said, This is for me. Some men joined him and believed. Jesus and the resurrection for me. And so I ask you, what is your reaction to the gospel message this morning? Do you secretly mock it? Some do. Do you postpone it? Who? Oh. Some of you have been postponing it for 50, 60, 70 years. Jesus tomorrow. Or do you accept it gladly as others did? And were saved. Amen. May God add a blessing to the preaching of his word.